In this tutorial, you will understand answers to the two questions related to microservice configuration, the what and the why. What is microservice configuration and why should we bother with it? Let's check it out. Okay, why should we care about microservice configuration? The thing is, configuration is essential for any production application, in my opinion. Any decent sized production application requires some kind of settings, some kind of putting all the right gears and the switches in the right place so that the application can do its job. And traditionally, the best practice is to take all those pieces and keep that aside from the actual code. For example, let's say you're working on an application that connects to a database. You have like the database connection string. You have credentials to the various different things that the application needs to connect to at runtime. So those are values which are not part of your business logic. So you obviously want to keep that in a separate place, in a separate file, which is externalized. The typical thing that typical advice that people give is don't hard code those things, right? What does it mean? It basically means when you have functioning code, which has logic in it, and then you have all these different data attributes, which are like connection strings or credentials or settings and all that stuff, you don't want to put those values directly in the code. You want to at least move them to like a property file or some kind of an XML file or a configuration file. Now, the question is, why do people say that? Why not hard code it? The reason is you want to have those values to be easily changeable without having to change your code. So the same thing applies with microservices as well. So when you're creating microservices, you want to have some kind of configuration values separated out from your code, right? Simple so far. Now, what, those, what do those values look like? What do those values even mean? Like what does configuration even mean? Let's look at some example configuration, okay? So what are the types of things that you would call as configuration? With microservices, you very likely are gonna be having database connections, right? You have connection strings, you have credentials. So that's an example of configuration. Credentials, not just database, but other kinds of credentials, maybe to a file share, maybe to some kind of an S3 bucket or something else, right? Some, some authenticated source of information that's needed for your application to do its job right? The application connects to those sources at runtime. You have feature flags as another example of configuration, quote unquote configuration. So what are feature flags? Feature flags are flags where you have, let's say you want to roll out a feature, but you're not sure how your feature is going to do. So what you do is you kind of put it behind a flag and then you say, okay, I'm going to enable this feature only from like 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. every night and see what the user engagement is, see how the users like it, see how the feature performs. And based on that, you can turn it on for a bit longer or even have a feature turn on only for a certain subset of users. And then based on how that feature does, enable it to more people. So you basically have some kind of a configuration which enables or disables a feature. So these are feature flags. You use that a lot in microservices, and this also needs to be configuration. You don't want to be deploying code every time you want to change. You want to allow more people to see a feature, right? You don't want to hard code that. You want to externalize it into a configuration. There's another example. Business logic configuration parameters. Let's say you have an online store where you want to experiment with some kind of a discount. You want to provide a discount of say 15%, see how many people buy your product, and then based on that, change it to 20%. This is normally handled using database, right? You have database values and some kind of an admin screen where the business user tries out these different things and then have it be like a purely application concern. But I have seen some people use business logic configuration also using configuration files. So this is another example, although a bit rarely used. Scenario testing. Um, you have, I talked about how you can have a portion of traffic go to a feature in order to enable it for more wide scale, depending on how the feature does. Scenario testing is kind of similar. This also has the name of A-B testing, 
where you have two different varieties of features and you want to enable one variety and see how that performs, but then you don't want to enable it to the entire traffic. So what you do is you say like, okay, 10% of my traffic is going to go to scenario A and 90% is going to go to scenario B. This scenario could be a business scenario. It could be a refactored piece of code, like a refactored microservice. You want to direct a small portion of the traffic there and you want to gradually scale it up using configuration. So let 10% of your traffic in. If that performs well, okay, I'm gonna let 20% in tomorrow, 30% the day after, and gradually ramp up the traffic. So this is also something that you use configuration files for. And finally, the most classic case for using configuration is for Spring Boot configuration. You're building applications with Spring Boot. Spring Boot as a framework itself has a lot of dials and levers and switches which allow how the framework performs. For example, in level two, we looked at fault tolerance and resilience. We had a lot of configuration parameters for things like hysterix, connection timeouts, and um, number of concurrent connections, error handling. So those are all configuration parameters which are in spring configuration. So you wanna have that also be configurable, but not using deploys, right? Whenever you wanna make a change, you don't wanna deploy another version of a microservice. You wanna be able to configure it using an externalized configuration system. So these are all classic examples of what configuration is and what are the kind of things that a configuration management system should allow you to change, right? When you have a decent configuration management system, you should be able to make changes to your database connections whenever you want. You should be able to make changes to Spring Boot configuration whenever you want. And you don't have to make deploys for you to be able to change those things, all right? So there are a few more needs for configuration. The classic need is the need to be able to push config to production without having to build and without having to test. Most microservices when you're deploying to, like if it's a decent scale microservice system and you're deploying to production, you're not doing this by hand, right? You're not gonna be clicking on a build button, having it build, taking that built artifact and deploying it somewhere. Commonly have like a CI CD system, right? You have like a build system, which takes a commit, right? Somebody checks in the code, it takes it automatically all the way to production and it deploys it maybe with one button click to actually deploy to production. It doesn't automatically deploy every commit to production. Maybe somebody says, okay, I want this build to go to production. It's a one button click to deploy something to prod, okay? This is there for a reason, because you wanna make sure all those different steps along the way go through for every change, right? Somebody makes a code change, you obviously want all the tests to run. You obviously want it to get built first for all your tests to run. So it's like there is a series of steps that need to happen before the code goes to production. Now, how about config changes? Let's say you wanna increase the number of threads on a microservice, right? Number of concurrent threads on a microservice. Well, you don't need to do build. You don't need to do test, right? This is just configuring a system which you already built and tested and deployed. So for config changes, you don't wanna go through that whole ceremony of deploying to prior. You wanna be able to push to production at any time. So this second piece, the config to prod, you wanna optimize it, okay? You wanna be able to make it fast, you wanna be able to make it easy, and you wanna be able to make it real time. So there are a few things that a configuration management system, a decent configuration management system should allow you to do. Okay, so before we get into what are the requirements of that configuration management system, let's talk about what are the different types of configs. Typically, historically in Java, configs have been in the form of XML files. Okay, people have been using XML files a lot and people are sick of XML files now, so you don't see a lot of XML files, but traditionally that's been the way in which you do config, okay? Um, take Hibernate, for example, your JPA systems, they used to do a lot of XML files. Java EE, the earlier versions of Java EE, a lot of XML files. Spring used to go crazy with XML files, but it's, it's past now, we don't do XML files anymore, thankfully, because those things were super duper verbose. These days, we use a bunch of different things. We use property files, we use YAML files. We'll, in the, in the, later in this course, we'll cover what YAML is and when to use properties versus YAML, but that's another format for configuration. And some of the frameworks use JSON files, which is 
close to YAML, but a little bit more verbose. So all these are a little more shorter and a little less verbose than XML files. So these are something that you would commonly see um, in configuration with Spring Boot as well. So these are the files that you're gonna save your configuration in. And these are the files that you wanna somehow affect in production. Right? I wouldn't say deploy because deploy has a bunch of connotations, which I talked about, like you know, the build and the, the you know the testing and all that stuff. I'm gonna say you have some property files or some YAML files or some JSON files somewhere, right? You wanna be able to make those changes to those files and somehow have the content of the file affect your production system, right? That's the goal. So what's the big deal with this thing? Like why not just put it along with the rest of your code? Well. The big deal is not only in the case of a regular application where you want to separate the configuration from the code. This becomes a bigger deal with microservices. We are dealing with microservices after all. With microservices, you have lots of them. It's not just one application in your externalizing configuration. You have lots and lots of microservices. You have multiple applications that talk to each other. And not just that, you have multiple copies of the same portion of the application, which is what microservices are, right? Let's say you want to scale a certain portion of your system. You have multiple instances of that microservice running in production. So you have multiple instances that you want to configure and manage. So you have a bunch of challenges there. So what are the goals, right? Let's We've talked about externalizing your configuration. We've talked about the challenges, especially when it comes to microservices. Here's what I want you to leave with when you complete this course. You should have the ability to have your configuration do the following. You should have your configuration be externalized. It should be separate from your main application logic. Okay, it should be separate, external. Second goal, it needs to be environment specific. It needs to be configurable in an environment-specific manner. What do I mean by this? Take database connections. You have a database connection string in your dev environment, points to the dev database. You deploy that same application to QA. It needs to connect to the QA database. You deploy that same application to production. Obviously, it needs to connect to the production database. So the configuration property itself is same. The application uses that value and does the same thing, right? We're just connecting to the database, but the value itself that it needs to read depends on the environment, right? So you need to be able to have a configuration management system, which is environment specific. You need to be able to say, hey, this is my property. Database connection is my property. This is the value in dev. This is the value in QA. This is the value in prod, right? You need to be able to do that. You need a good system to be able to do this easily. Third goal, it needs to be consistent. You have 10 different copies of your same microservice running. How would it be if nine copies of it look at one value of your configuration and the 10th copy is looking at a slightly older value of your configuration? That's not good, right? You want your configuration values to be consistent across all your application. Unless you want it to be different, in which case you need to be able to make it different as well, which is another problem. But the idea is you want control over it, right? If you want one of them to be have a different value, another to have a different value, that's a different problem. But most of the times that's not the case. You want all your microservices, all your instances of microservices to be looking at the same values. The fourth goal is you need to have some kind of version history. The good thing about putting configuration in your code is that you get version history along with it, right? You have some kind of a source control system. So whatever you check in goes along for the ride. You can say, okay, this configuration change was checked in at this particular time. This other configuration change was checked in there. So you can, you can kind of figure that out. But if you externalize it from the code, well, you have the advantage of pushing it whenever you want, but then the disadvantage is, well, now you lose all the tracking and all the ability to know when what change was made. So you need to be able to control that and monitor that as well. You need version history. You need to say, okay, when was this configuration change made? What was the value before it, right? When was that change made and so on? You need to be able to track it. So this is another goal. And then finally, you need to be able to have some kind of real-time management. 
let's say you have uh, a lot of threads which are consuming your gateway or your one of your microservices and you want to increase the number of concurrent threads well one way to do it is to get this application down make the change and bring it up but you don't want to do that you want these changes to happen in real time you want to be able to make a change and have the change effect while all your microservices are actually running okay so this is another goal so these are all the goals associated with what our ideal configuration management system should be and by the end of these series of videos you will have something which does all of these but we're going to go step by step we're going to start from the minimal and the easiest all the way to the fully fledged solution which is going to check all these different items we're going to start with the minimal solution which is simply putting configuration in a property file okay spring boot has this concept of a property file application or properties if you've been working with spring boot you will have seen this particular file you can put your configuration in that file and have your application read it so there you go externalized checked already right you have some kind of an external thing which is not associated with the code although it's a little bit of a not a green check it's kind of like in between green and red because even though it's externalized it's still a part of the jar so we're going to start from the basics for configuration we're going to see how you can leverage the power of property file itself because it's actually super powerful and not a lot of people know all the different features that you can achieve with it so we're going to start from there all the way to spring cloud config server and uh, we will see how you can use that configuration in your microservices. All right, so in the next tutorial, we're gonna start with square one, which is taking a value from a property file and using it in your application. We're gonna use an annotation called at value to achieve this. And we're gonna look at some of the powerful features of this annotation, which you might not know about. So see you in the next tutorial.